to turn this over to uh, Ben Lavender. He's going to tell you a little bit about um, his experience in um, selecting a career and how teachers have impacted him and also some of the work that uh, we do, do through Bay Work and that he does through Central Sand uh, to engage teachers. Ben? Sure. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, I just thought it would be, we all thought it would be helpful just to have sort of my story as, as kind of a case study. Um, as you know, we just saw um, a lot of the work that all of our agencies do uh, is really rich with, with science and environmental learning. As you'll continue to hear, it's rich with applied engineering and chemistry and biology and physics, uh, which I definitely very much uh, am in support of. Uh, and one of the things you'll also continue to hear is, is about all of the really great and diverse career options uh, for students, for them to you know, be involved in this really important and necessary work. Um, so I thought I would just tell a little bit about sort of my story and how I got in, into the industry. Um, I toured my first wastewater treatment plant uh, about 20 years ago as part of a class. Um, and it was impressed upon me then uh, that, that there really isn't a more important environmental question than what we do with our dirty water. Um, as we sort of saw in our presentation, and, and in many ways it's the difference between sort of living in a sort of healthy, hospitable world and, and, and not. Um, and I took that learning and I, I, uh, I became a high school environmental science and biology teacher. Um, and as part of my teaching with students, I brought them to wastewater treatment plants because I still felt that that question was really pressing and important. And I brought them to East Bay Mud uh, and I brought them to Central San. Um, and then later when I became the senior manager of teacher professional development for Cal Academy in San Francisco, um, and we would do teacher NGSS trainings. Again, as part of our science and environmental learning, uh, we brought them to treatment plants because you can't really understand this story of, of you know, our environment and our impacts of it without seeing what happens to our dirty water after it goes down the drain. And so I brought our teachers to the SFPUC and to the city of Pacifica. Um, I, I grew up in Oakland and so I knew East Bay Mud had educational resources. Um, I kind of dreamed up my current role uh, at Central San, which is creating and developing and delivering curriculum to, to students. Um, and I told you know, this very story in my cover letter and in my interview to, to Central San uh, when I started about two years ago, um, which is there, there really isn't a more important environmental question than what happens to our dirty water uh, and what we do about that. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I definitely have the pleasure of bringing a bunch of rich science and applied engineering out to classrooms all over Central Contra Costa County and now virtually beyond. Um, I believe very much in the importance of our work all around the Bay Area. And I believe very much in the importance of, of helping students consider, you know, these jobs as potential career pathways because in many ways these are some of the the best most local um sort of ways that we can sort of be impacting our environment um and i will talk a lot more about that um this sort of this afternoon in in my sort of breakout session um but i want to hand it over to my colleague nate who's going to talk a little bit you know, just about Central Sand and the wastewater treatment process in depth. Hello, everyone. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to join this session. Ben, very well said. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and talk to you a little bit about what we do at a wastewater treatment plant and how we get all that wastewater to our facility. Let's see, hopefully my screen is now up. So again, thanks everyone. My name is Nate Morales. I am a senior engineer here at the Central Contra Costa Sanitary District. Um, I have been at the district now for about 15 years and this was actually my first job right out of college. I graduated from UC Davis as with a mechanical engineering degree. And actually my, my last year at Davis, I sort of stumbled my way into an internship opportunity at Central Contra Costa Sanitary District. And of course, as a young, know nothing mechanical engineering student, I, um, I had 
you know, I was excited about the big things, the things you could talk about, airplanes and, and cars and other traditional me mechanical engineering routes. But I found myself at Central San working in none other than wastewater. And, you know, on weekends during my internship, going home and talking to my friends, finding myself at parties, talking about, about what I did, about dealing with everything that folks flush down the toilet. And in fact, was a little, found myself a little bit embarrassed by it. Um, but I pressed on and 15 years later, I look back and I just think, man, I am so blessed to have, to have fallen into the world of wastewater. For many of the reasons Ben described, it has been a, a fantastic career path. It is challenging and is interesting. And overall, it just feels good to know that we are meaningfully impacting the environment around us. So that's a little snippet of my story. But today I'm here to talk to you about um, the business of wastewater collection and treatment. Um, as you all know, Central San, uh, I work for Central San. We are a wastewater treatment plant located in Martinez. We serve about 500,000 people along the 680 corridor. And in our service area, there's about 3,000 businesses that also discharge their, their wastewater to us. Um, just want to lay, before I move on, uh, this is going to be about a half hour presentation. Same story as with Matthew's presentation. At the end, uh, if you guys go ahead and type in any questions in the chat window, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to address them then. Okay, so let's get into it. So our 500,000 customers, they, they do their laundry, they take showers, they, they, they brush their teeth, and of course, they flush their toilets. And all of that, that water runs down their drain through, uh, through pipelines into our collection system. The pipelines that are out buried in the streets out in, out in front of your houses, are, they're typically smaller. They're six to eight inches in diameter. And then as that water flows closer and closer to the treatment plant, the, as you might guess, the pipes get larger and larger and larger until they're the size of the, the um, interceptor pipes that Matt talked about. We also have pipes that are six, seven, eight, nine feet in diameter um, that are actually enter the treatment plant. Treatment plants are, are situated or located carefully. They're located on low ground so that by and large, you can tr um, transfer or transmit all the water from house to plant by gravity, because gravity is, is free and it's cheap and it's easy. Most agencies, though, find themselves in with some customers that are in low-lying areas that require some pumping. And so at Central San, we have, um, we have about 17 or so pump stations that pump out of areas like Orinda and Moraga up over the hill so that they can flow by gravity um, to our treatment plant. So we're gonna, we've got two things to talk about here. One is our collection system, which is the network of pipes that are buried in the streets, and then also the treatment plant. So first, let's talk about the collection system. As I mentioned, there's about 1,500 miles of pipe, and it, in order to maintain and operate all that pipe takes a lot of work. We've got crews that every day go out and clean these pipes. Um, they, some guys run trucks that TV the pipes. We have cameras that are mounted to, to tracks and they, they drive up these pipelines and inspect them for cleanliness or inspect them for damage. Um, we also have crews that do other things like locate underground sewer lines to in, if another company is gonna come dig up a street to ensure that they don't get damaged. And then finally, we also have crews who are responsible for going out and digging up um, pipes that have maybe have broken or have, have a major clog or something that can't be uh, re retrieved otherwise. So this photo here shows one of our large um, water flushing trucks. I'll talk about more than that in a second. And here's um, one, of our, one of our guys running the TV truck. So you can see he's got the TV footage here in these screens and he's sitting in the back of a box fan out in the middle of the street somewhere in our service area. 
Here is a, a few photos of our collection system maintenance crews in action. Most of the pipes are buried in the streets and we do that intentionally because they're typically they're easier to access. But in some places in the hillier regions of our district, like up in Lafayette or Moraga, you know, these jobs as potential career pathways because in many ways these are some of the the best most local um, sort of ways that we can sort of be impacting our environment um, and I will talk a lot more about that um, this sort of this afternoon in, in my sort of breakout session um, but I want to hand it over to my colleague Nate who's going to talk a little bit you know, just about central sand and the wastewater treatment process in depth. Hello, everyone. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to join this session. Ben, very well said. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and talk to you a little bit about what we do at a wastewater treatment plant and how we get all that wastewater to our facility. Let's see, hopefully my screen is now up. So again, thanks everyone. My name is Nate Morales. I am a senior engineer here at the Central Contra Costa Sanitary District. Um, I have been at the district now for about 15 years and this was actually my first job right out of college. I graduated from UC Davis as with a mechanical engineering degree. And actually my, my last year at Davis, I sort of stumbled my way into an internship opportunity at Central Contra Costa Sanitary District. And of course, as a young, know nothing mechanical engineering student, I, um, I had, you know, I was excited about the big things, the things you could talk about, airplanes and, and cars and other traditional me mechanical engineering routes. But I found myself at Central Sand working in none other than wastewater. And, you know, on weekends during my internship, going home and talking to my friends, finding myself at parties, talking about, about what I did, about dealing with everything that folks flush down the toilet. And in fact, was a little, found myself a little bit embarrassed by it. Um, but I pressed on and 15 years later, I look back and I just think, man, I am so blessed to have, to have fallen into the world of wastewater. For many of the reasons Ben described, it has been a, a fantastic career path. It is challenging and is interesting. And overall, it just, feels good to know that we are meaningfully impacting the environment around us. So that's a little snippet of my story. But today I'm here to talk to you about um, the business of wastewater collection and treatment. Um, as you all know, Central San, uh, I work for Central San. We are a wastewater treatment plant located in Martinez. We serve about 500,000 people along the 680 corridor. and in our service area, there's about 3,000 businesses that also discharge their, their wastewater to us. Um, just want to lay, before I move on, uh, this is going to be about a half hour presentation. Same story as with Matthew's presentation. At the end, uh, if you guys go ahead and type in any questions in the chat window, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to address them then. Okay, so let's get into it. So our 500,000 customers, they, they do their laundry, they take showers, they, they, they brush their teeth, and of course, they flush their toilets. And all of that, that water runs down their drain through, uh, through pipelines into our collection system. The pipelines that are out buried in the streets out in, out in front of your houses, are, they're typically smaller. They're six to eight inches in diameter. And then as that water flows closer and closer to the treatment plant, the, as you might guess, the pipes get larger and larger and larger until they're the size of the, the um, interceptor pipes that Matt talked about. We also have pipes that are six, seven, eight, nine feet in diameter um, that are actually enter the treatment plant. 
treatment plants are are situated or located carefully they're located on low ground so that by and large you can tr um, transfer or transmit all the water from house to plant by gravity because gravity is is free and it's cheap and it's easy most agencies though find themselves in with some customers that are in low-lying areas that require some pumping and so at central san we have um we have about 17 or so pump stations that pump out of areas like Orinda and Moraga up over the hill so that they can flow by gravity um, to our treatment plant. So we're gonna, we've got two things to talk about here. One is our collection system, which is the network of pipes that are buried in the streets, and then also the treatment plant. So first, let's talk about the collection system. As I mentioned, there's about 1,500 miles of pipe. And it, in order to maintain and operate all that pipe takes a lot of work. We've got crews that every day go out and clean these pipes. Um, they, some guys run trucks that TV the pipes. We have cameras that are mounted to, to tracks and they, they drive up these pipelines and inspect them for cleanliness or inspect them for damage. Um, we also have crews that do other things like locate underground sewer lines to if another company is going to come dig up a street to ensure that they don't get damaged. And then finally, we also have crews who are responsible for going out and digging up um, pipes that have maybe have broken or have, have a major clog or something that can't be uh, re retrieved otherwise. So this photo here shows one of our large um, water flushing trucks. I'll talk about more than that in a second. And here's um, one, of our, one of our guys running the TV truck. So you can see he's got the TV footage here in these screens and he's sitting in the back of a box fan out in the middle of the street somewhere in our service area. Here is a, a few photos of our collection system maintenance crews in action. Most of the pipes are buried in the streets and we do that intentionally because they're typically they're easier to access but in some places in the hillier regions of our district like up in Lafayette or Moraga, Arinda, there are pipes that are on hillsides and in backyards and in generally difficult to access so you can see here our guys are pulling this high pressure hose up a hill um, in order to clean a pipe um, and these guys are doing something called hand riding, rotting, which is a manual process of cleaning pipe. Big excavators, guys in trenches, all the work that you might imagine take place in order to maintain and replace sewers. So sewer blockages. This right here is the enemy of our collection system group. They fight every single day in order to ensure that sewer blockages and more importantly, sewer overflows do not happen. You can imagine that you've got all this water, millions of gallons of water flowing towards our plant every day. And if any of the pipes were to get clogged, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't take long for that water to back up and come out the top of a manhole. And that's what we strive to avoid. There's two main types of sewer blockages that we experience at in Central Contra Costa Sanitary District, and this is pretty universal among all wastewater treatment plants. The first of which is a root intrusion. Um, now, I think Emiliano, you asked about the history of, of pipes, and we're lucky enough at Central San not to have wood pipes, but we do have 100-year-old uh, pipes in areas like Martinez and some of the older neighborhoods that were um, that are 100 years old and that are made of clay. And in, in fact, clay pipes were installed for, I don't know, 50 or 60 years beyond that um, into the middle of the 19th, in the middle of the century. So the, the good thing about clay is that it is, it is, they do not corrode. Clay pipe will last hundreds, probably thousands of years without breaking down. But the downside with clay is that it's brittle. And so, and also when, when they originally installed these things, they, they come in very short segments and so it's brittle and you have many many joints and so over time we've found that the clay pipe is typically the first to crack fracture collapse and in all and in all these small cracks tree roots uh, in search of water and nutrients and let's be honest wastewater is a fantastic source for water nutrients 
tree roots will find their way through the smallest of cracks and continue to extend their roots, their roots inward. And so you can imagine that with time, more and more roots intrude into the pipe. And before long, a, um, there's not enough room for water to flow and you, you have a blockage. The second mechanism that we often see that clauses, clogs pipes is the buildup of fats, oils, and grease. You may have seen some of our outreach efforts that basically say, encourage um, you to not pour grease down the drain, like a bacon grease is a great example. That's a surefire way to clog up not only the, the drains in your own home, but also the, um, our, our sewer lines. And so if you look here at this photo, uh, or here in the lower left corner, you can see this is what grease and oil and fats look like as they build up on the inside of a pipe. It's a, a lot like arteries getting, getting clogged as we age. The fat builds from the outside inward more and more and more until pretty soon there's not enough space for water to flow. And so the, our two main tools against these two uh, types of buildup is the, um, for fog, we, we typically use a high pressure water jet. So this is a truck filled with water the hose runs down the pipe and just blasts all this fog off to allow it to encourage it to flow down the sewer. And with the roots, we have another truck, which is the, basically we call it a rotter, has a steel rod on the back and has a series of three blades that rub up against the, the inside of that pipe and then turn as it runs down the pipe and cut away any roots. And you can see right here in this photo, this is the photo of one of our guys. Um, pulling up one of the, the rotting tools with a big ball of roots that they've uh, re recovered. And actually right here, the same story. So I would be remiss if I did not start down on one of our other uh, outreach campaigns, and that is the, um, the prevalence of flushable wipes. I think that we've all hopefully used them or seen them in our, in our home. They're sold as, um, as, a, you know, as a nice, tough, pre-moist, maybe some soap or cleaning agent on it that is just out of the package, ready to go, ready to clean um, countertops or ourselves. And the problem is that manufacturers have listed these as flushable. Well, in fact, they do go down the toilet pretty easily. They are very, very bad for our collection system. Uh, they, the problem is that they are unlike toilet paper. Toilet paper will break down within a few hundred feet into small particulates. Flusher wipes are so tough that they stay intact as they travel the two to 30 miles down the sewer line to the wastewater treatment plant. You can see here that Anthony has just finished removing a ball of flushable wipes out of one of our pumps at, at a pump station. And uh, the space, I don't know if you guys can see it, but the look on his face tells it all. It's not a fun job. It's stinky, it's smelly, and it is, uh, it, it's, 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 it's no good. And so you know, don't flush the flushable wipes, only toilet paper down the drain. All right, that is, that is my spiel for the collection system. Again, if you have any questions regarding any of those topics, just type them in the chat window and we'll address them in a few minutes here. I'm gonna move on to the treatment plant. So as you might guess, our customers flush their toilets and, and run their sinks 24 hours a day. And so our facility also runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. On average, we receive about 40 million gallons of wastewater per day. And almost all of that water gets cleaned and then discharged to Sassoon Bay, which is an offshoot of San Francisco Bay. A smaller portion of that water gets cleaned to a further degree and then redistributed um, as and under water reuse. Matt alluded to that in his, in his presentation. Basically, our reuse customers, our recycled water customers, use this water for irrigation or industrial uses. We have, um, for example, a lot of golf courses will use the, the recycled water to water their facilities. Matt also mentioned in his in his presentation that, that due to aging infrastructure of our collection system, um, the, the integrity of our pipes, and especially the clay, the clay pipes I was talking about, 
is not sound. These pipes are not necessarily watertight. So when it rains, the ground becomes saturated, and then that groundwater seeps into our pipes and increases the amount of volume that we get at our treatment plant substantially. Uh, we get 40 million gallons on an average summer day, but if it is really, really raining in, in the wintertime, we can get up to 200, I think our record is 250 million gallons per day, so substantially more water. Let's see. All right, so here we go. This is, this is we're getting into the nitty gritty now, and you should see some, some trends here between the, the types of processes I'm gonna describe and the, the, the regulations that implemented these processes that Matt talked about. So we're gonna talk about primary treatment, um, secondary treatment, tertiary treatment, which is basically that, that extra step we take to make um, recycled water that can be used on those golf courses. And then of course, solids treatment. So let me take a moment here and just say that our goal at the wastewater treatment plant is basically to remove all the solids that have been introduced into the water, take those solids out and send the clean water on its way to the bay. Those solids, as you can guess, is everything that we put it, we, we wash off of, of our bodies and, um, and, and dishes and everything else in our households, right? So when we take a shower, we introduce a little bit of dirt in the drain. When we, when we do our dishes or, or run our garbage disposal, I think I saw a question on the garbage disposals. When you run your garbage disposal, you grind up that celery, it goes down the drain and off to the treatment plant. Um, and then of course, everything that goes that we flush down the toilet, right? It's our goal to remove all those solids, separate those solids from the water. And the solids treatment is the process we use to dispose of those solids. So here is a high level overview, a little schematic of our process. And we're not gonna spend too much time on this. Um, I just wanted to pull this little piece of the schematic out that focuses on pr primary treatment. You can see there's a few major steps to primary treatment and we're gonna cruise through those now. So the first step in primary treatment is removing all of the big solids. And the way that we do that is we use these things called bar screens. I'm gonna push play on this video and you're, you can see that these bar screens, they are a, a line of narrow bars. They're about a quarter inch apart. So anything that is narrower than a quarter inch will pass through. Anything that's larger than a quarter inch gets caught on the bar screen and then picked up by this rake here that we're seeing moving. And then the rake um, brings those caught solids up and um, to and drops them into this sluice right here. This is, you see in a moment, a, a slop of, of stuff that got caught on the bars and it goes down this sluice to be, to be um, compacted. Now, I don't know if you guys caught it, but I wanna again point out that um, most of what was getting caught on, these, on this bar screen was flushable wipes. They're back to haunt us. Here they are, we're, we're, they're getting caught and we're, and we're trying to remove them. So, these, everything gets caught, goes down this sluice way, and then um, into a big compactor where we squeeze all the water out of it that we can and shove it through this pipe and basically make these huge sausages of, the, of whatever we caught. And here is a photo of the, our big old um, screenings sausages. These are about 18 inches in diameter. And again, if you look at that consistency, it's, it's, these is mostly flushable wipes. And of course there's a bunch of other stuff, but in large, large part it's flushable wipes. Um, so this then gets hauled off to a landfill. All right, so from there, um, we take the water that passes through the bar screen and pump it up to the primary tanks. These are the pumps that we use to pump the water up to those up to ground level those primary tanks. You have to think about it. This water has just um, flowed miles and miles and miles. And in order for the gravity system to work, we have to bury our influence structures 20 or 30 feet deep in the ground in order for that gravity action to work. Well, it's so deep that you can't really work with it. So this first step here is to pump the water up to ground level. And these pumps are huge. They, I think the ones in the foreground are 700 horsepower, and that's a typical size for some of our larger pumps at the plant. 
they'll you know they run 24 hours a day and they'll they, they move water they move water really well as you'd guess they fill an average backyard swimming pool in a couple seconds so from these pumps we flow into the primary tanks and this is what matt was talking about this is this is what the regulators um, uh, imposed in the 1950s, the implementation of, implementation of primary sedimentation. This is a long tank, and the objective here is to introduce the water into the front and move it as slowly as possible across the tank to allow anything that's denser than water to slowly settle to the bottom. All the big chunks, right, as Matt said. So the big chunks, they, they settle the bottom, and then we have a scraper that runs along the bottom and collects those solids and pumps them over to our solids handling process. So that's the, this is the workhorse of the, of the primary treatment process. From here, we move on to the secondary process. And as we just learned in the mid-1970s, the secondary process um, was mandated that, that they be installed and again here is a little schematic of our secondary process we're today we're going to talk about these three components the aeration tanks secondary clarifiers and uv so from the primary tanks water flows to our aeration tanks um, and i'm going to move to this next slide so you can see a photo of an aeration tank so think about it now we have we have again our objective is to remove all of the solids from the water We've just removed everything that's heavier than water that settled out in the primary tank. And so what's left is all of this super fine particulate and anything that has dissolved in the water. And so in this stage of the process, we're gonna do our best to remove all of these ultra fine and dissolved solids that's left in the water. The way we do that is by empl employing billions, probably trillions of little tiny microorganisms that want nothing more than to consume these little bits of organics. It, to them, this is food, right? And so I'm gonna push play on this video. Um, and this is what the water looks like because it's flowing into the beginning of our, our aeration tank. Um, you can maybe pick up the fact that it's sort of bubbling out here. That's because at the bottom of this tank, there's uh, diffusers that are releasing ultrafine air bubbles in order to increase the dissolved oxygen here. Because the little tiny um, microorganisms, the bugs as we call them, they're living in this water. They need water to, I mean, excuse me, they need air to respirate and to do their job. So what we're looking at here, this is a feeding frenzy. These bugs, they just got introduced with all this food. They are going to town. It is Buffet City and they are chowing down. And as they do so, they intake all these solids and they multiply and, and eat more. And by the time the water reaches the end of this tank, pretty much all of the solids that were in the water have now have been consumed by these bugs or now are basically in, now essentially in their cell walls. And the other thing that happens, that happens here is we are careful to select, well, we're careful to set up conditions that, um, that al allow for the type of bugs that we prefer to, um, to, ex to excel. And so in this case, what we want is we want bugs that want to consume these nutrients, but all equally important is we want bugs that after consuming them, they form clumps. And if we've done our job right, then at the end of this tank, we've got clumps of these little guys, all fat and happy, um, hanging out together, which sets us up perfectly for the next phase of the process, the clarifier. So here is um, a traditional secondary clarifier. Uh, it, it, works very similarly to our primary tank. Basically, the water that just came from the aeration tank is, is discharged in the center well, and the water then moves very, very slowly outward towards the edge of the tank. And because there's no turbulence, all those, all those microorganisms that are hanging out together, they're denser than water, and they very slowly settle to the bottom of the tank. 
and the clean water then reaches the edge and spills out over the top. So the clean water goes on to the next step of the process and all those, um, the bugs that are at the bottom, we suck them up with a little water vacuum and we send them over to the solids building for, for processing. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So from here, the water is, is quite clean. Um, this, is, this is the tank where we'll most commonly see ducks and seagulls. They love hanging out here. Um, there's just one final step that needs to take place before we can discharge this water to the bay and that is disinfection. And so there's a couple primary or common ways that wastewater treatment plants disinfect their wastewater. Uh, many agencies will use chlorine, which is effectively bleach to kill anything that's left off, any bacteria, virus, or any of these microorganisms that, that slip past our system. Um, but we at the district, we use UV disinfection. I don't have a great photo for you, but basically we run the water through these channels that have thousands and thousands of UV emitting light bulbs that uh, kill any of the bacteria or bugs that are left. We basically sunburn them to death. So that is the end of the secondary process. Um, from here, let's talk about the solids process a bit. Oh, actually, no, I forgot one, one point. I've got one slide here, again, no, no great photos, but a little snippet from the schematic. Recall that we take a portion of the water that we send to the bay and clean it to a further degree. So we do that at this facility we call the filter plant, and it's, it's, it's essentially a form of tertiary treatment. At our fil filter plant, we have a layer of, of basically crushed coal, we call it anthracite, over a bed of sand, which is over a bed of gravel. And the water is, is poured on top of this media. And as the water trickles down through the, um, through the sand and through the, the crushed products, it gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and all the remaining particulate gets, gets caught up. This works a lot like groundwater infiltration out on the earth. It's just as rain percolates through a soil and gets cleaner and cleaner as it goes, we, this is water you know, percolating through this sand media. And so then from there, it goes off to, to reuse to our, you know, to our golf courses and to our industrial users like we talked about. Okay, now I think we're ready for the solids process. So there's a, there's a few different components of, of our solids process. Our solids process is a little bit unique. Um, and I will talk about how we deal with our solids and I'll mention briefly how most agencies manage and their, their solids as well. So we have now taken, we've got solids that have settled to the bottom of the tank in our primary tanks, right? All the big stuff. We've got all these, these fat and happy bugs that have settled to the bottom of the clarifiers and we pump all that materia, material over to a blending tank. We blend it all together and at this point, it's a right around 97%, maybe 96% water. It's mostly water with a little bit of other stuff in it. And at our facility, we um, incinerate our sludge. And so you can imagine that if we're gonna incinerate this stuff in a huge furnace, then you wanna have as little water as possible. So for the, the first step is we run the, this sludge through a centrifuge. And this is a picture of one of our centrifuges. It's not too glamorous on the surface, but basically inside of here is a cylinder and it, and it spins very, very fast and creates centrifugal acceleration. And just like the spin cycle on our washing machines, the water is separated from the solids. And so the water goes back to drain and the solids, now that they've been thickened up, are ready to go to our furnace. At this point, we've removed a fair amount of water, but not all the water. It's about, our, the product is right around 70% water and 30% solid. So from there, we pump this, this, this solid. It's, it's sort of the toothpaste, uh, excuse me, it's a consistency of toothpaste. Thick, it's dark brown. It's probably the most foul substance we have at our facility. We affectionately call it cake because of the color, but trust me, you wanna get nowhere near it. So this cake gets pumped to our furnace 
And our furnace is a, this large three-story structure. And the solids are introduced into the top. And it, in the first few stages, this cake gets dries out until it's dry enough to combust. And then, as you might guess, it gets burned down to essentially nice ash. And I've got a little video here of the inside of the furnace. We'll push play. And what you can see is there's a huge arm inside of this furnace that spins around and mixes up the cake to keep it, um, to keep it mixed, uh, to help all there not be wet spots, to help get complete combustion. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the story. This system does a really, really good job of reducing the, um, the volume and the mass of the solids. I believe that we, into our centrifuges, we feed somewhere around 3 million pounds of this watery solids. And by the time it, it comes out the bottom of the furnace, it's been reduced down to around 15,000 pounds. Uh, that's per day, 15,000 pounds of dry, sterile ash, which actually has beneficial use. Um, we use that ash as a, it's, we sell it to a, a, a soil company and it's used as soil amendment for the most part. The other thing that's worth noting here is that there is, there is value in this sludge. There's a value in this combustion process. We actually are able to gather much of the heat that's being generated by burning these solids we take that heat, we run it through a boiler, we make steam, and then we use that steam to turn a big blower that blows air into those bubbling aeration tanks. And so in that way, we try to be efficient with the process. All right, so we are, are absolutely that minority in the fact that we burn our, our solids for disposal. Most facilities like East Bay Mud and everyone else in the Bay Area have digesters. And so instead of burning and their, for their sludge, they instead take that soupy mixture and pump it into a large tank that's called a digester. And in here, there's a different type of microorganism um, that basically consumes or metabolizes those, those solids and as a byproduct produces CO2, but most importantly, methane gas, biogas, which can then be used to generate electricity and generate heat to keep the temperatures in this digester up. Because in order for this digester to function, the temperature has to be fairly warm. So I think that's, that's we've reached the end of the treatment plant process. Got a couple of slides for you on just sort of the maintenance of, of this complex treatment plant system, and then we will open it up to questions. So we talked about some of the major equipment, the, we, but also we have boilers on site. We have huge, we have a huge generator that runs on natural gas. Um, that it's essentially a jet engine that turns a big generator. We have huge diesel powered engines to generate power in the event that PG&E um, goes out of service. We have uh, just a whole array of, of huge and interesting um, equipment that for someone like myself, a mechanical engineer, I find so fascinating. Um, these systems, as you might guess, require a ton of maintenance and attention. There's, you can see here the number on the slide, there's something on the order of 5,700 pieces of equipment or assets at our facility. Um, these things range from small $2 parts to multi-million dollar large pieces of equipment. We have a team of maintenance staff that includes mechanics and electricians and instrument techs who spend their days um, performing work on these on these systems, replacing parts, rebuilding pumps, um, re-investigating electrical work, and of course their objective is to is to address all issues be before they come real issues, right? In terms of basically preventative maintenance. So almost all the work that we do is is preventative in nature, but of course we do have 
failures that catch us off guard where guys have to be called in on weekends or nights to come in and take care of an, uh, an issue if it's deemed to be critical. So that's the story. That's, that's our treatment plant in a nutshell. Um, although our systems are not identical, all the treatment plants, it's most, for the most part fairly similar. I, it's, I, I'm passionate about it. I find it fascinating. I hope you guys got a little taste of that. Um, there's a lot that goes on here. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions and uh, see what you guys got. Great. Um, so uh, I have to apologize at first if I mispronounce anyone's name. So, um, because I probably already have. FEMA, FEMA uh, Bernino was asking, aside from the solids to be separated and the water density, do you add anything or something into the water? I'm thinking this is the beginning of the treatment. Uh, other than the, the bugs, mm -hmm. I, I, this is my addition, to make the water separate faster or is the bugs the thing? If we are doing well, if our process, so this is a, a big living, breathing system, right? We are relying on these bugs to stay healthy and happy to do their job. If all is going well, we, have, we do not have to introduce any additional chemicals to aid with the separation. At times, things do go bad. Um, sometimes it's due to weather or temperature. Other times it's because we'll have illegal discharges where chemical is discharged in the sewer system that will, that will damage or kill the bugs. And in those times we do, we do have to add um, chemicals to, to aid the process, but that's very rare. And really what happens most frequently is, as I was mentioning, there's a certain species or a few species of bugs that we really, really want to promote. And at times if things get out of whack, other species of microorganisms that don't settle as well will take over and become predominant. And oftentimes we'll need to treat with actually with chlorine, with bleach to, to uh, knock back those less desirable microorganisms to in order to promote the ones we want. Now that's in the main treatment process. There are um, smaller processes that we didn't have time to get into today where we absolutely do add, we sometimes add chemical to aid the separation. Great, great. And then uh, FEMA also asked, uh, how is the treatment operation affected uh, by this present situation? For example, viruses, um, the, the COVID, is that yeah. impacting uh, anything? In yeah, treatment? good question. That's a good question. Yeah. You know, I'm by no means an expert on this. Um, most of what I know is through reading some of probably the same, some of the same news articles that you have. Um, in terms of the, the basic uh, operation, we have seen no meaningful change in the wastewater characteristics that are coming to the plant. Although there is one interesting tidbit that's changed. As you might guess, um, we see different, there, during pre-COVID, we would see the most flow around seven, eight in the morning. Well, it would leave people's homes at seven or eight in the morning when everyone's getting ready for work and then reach us around 11 or 12. And that was typical for a weekday. But during a weekend, when everyone is getting up later, you, we could see where the flow reach us later and be a little more well distributed through the day. Well, interestingly, now that COVID is in place and that many folks are working from home, we're seeing that weekend flow be more predominant than the typical weekday flow. So, but other than that, no major changes. And you know, I think many of you, I'm sure, have read that it is has been shown that uh, that COVID, the COVID nineteen virus, can be found in wastewater. I think it's I've seen articles that it can be used as sort of an early predictor to see mm -hmm. if COVID is present in an area. Although we have not done any of that testing in our facility. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I forgot about that. That's really interesting. Um, there's been a number of questions that are coming in about careers for students and where to get education. And uh, Michael Kushner, uh, the uh, Baywork manager, actually addressed that. Actually, on our a little plug for the baywork.org website, we have, uh, we, we have a lot of different lists of the careers that are available in this industry and it's just a partial list but they're mostly the mission crit critical positions the ones that um 
in, the, in most cases, you just you can't just walk in off the street. There are licenses required, and you have to take tests, and it's pretty regulated. Um, so uh, hopefully, we'll be able to address that a little bit more in our afternoon sessions. Is, is that right, Steve? I, I'm thinking that we're going to be we're going to have some breakout rooms and some uh, ways that we can talk to you about how we can help you and what you need for as educators. Um, yeah. And also East Bay Mud, uh, Sophia is also has some internships and, and I know different agencies. Um, I'm not sure if Central Sand has internships too. Yeah, we sure do. Um, well, this, this summer is a little different for yeah. obvious reasons, but, but typically we do hire summer interns for both the, the technical engineering and, and science like uh, laboratory um, type positions, um, but also we have internships for those who are interested in the trades. We have um, internships in some of our, our field shops. Um, and then additionally, we offer um, co what we call co-ops, which are basically a six month internship, which we highly encourage, especially for the more technical positions. Um, every, we basically have a steady stream of, I don't know, I wanna say 10-ish, maybe five to 10-ish co-ops that are working at various departments at our facility. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. And if you recall, I started off my story by saying that I was at a career fair at UC Davis 15 years ago and stumbled on the Central Sand booth and got myself an internship and here I am 15 years later. That's a great story. Um, and going back to the processes a little bit, I had a question of, um, do you, do you all use, I, I thought I heard you mention diesel. Do you use that as the fuel to, uh, uh, or what do you use as the fuel in the, um, in, uh, to burn the solids? And mm -hmm. also, are you planning on ever switching to the digester model? Great questions. So regarding the fuel, we, there is a landfill near our facility. And so we have a pipeline that runs from that landfill to our solids building. We buy biogas, landfill gas from, from the landfill and use it as a primary fuel in our furnace. Um, this obviously is, it's more affordable for us. So it's good financially for our rate payers, but also um, it's considered to be, um, it's, we, we basically are held to um, certain CO2 emission standards, greenhouse gas emission standards. And by using gas from the landfill, it doesn't count towards that because it's a, it's like a, it's a reused fuel. It's a renew, regenerative fuel. Um, so the second question, do we plan to move to digesters? There has been many conversations about exactly that topic over the years. And for the time being, the plan is to stick with our current incineration process. Although we're the, in the minority um, in using incineration, there are some distinct advantages. And that is the biggest of which is that our, our product at the end of the process is this sterile ash. Whereas most other, other wastewater treatment plants end up with a, a, a biosolid. It's a, it's a cake. It's, 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 it's a little bit more costly and difficult to dispose of. I mean, everyone all over the world does dispose of it. So it's not a huge deal, but the ash is, is definitely an easier product to deal with at the end. And that's one part of it. This, the second part is, is the financial reality. And that is that the cost of migrating to digesters um, at this point, considering all the investments we have in the current infrastructure would just be colossal and really is just not, financially feasible at this time. Good. Uh, Juliet has, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, Juliet Hammock said, you mentioned that uh, some water needs bleach treatments. How do you treat the water after treating with bleach to make it safe to release? Or is the amount of bleach low enough that it doesn't need further treatment when mixed with other water? Um, this, the basic answer is that the concentrations are so, so low that it's, it's a non-issue. I'm not a, not a freshwater drinking water guy, but I'm pretty sure that there's mandates that say that any of the drinking water that goes out in our drinking water system has very mind trace, uh, trace amounts of, of hypochlorite of bleach in it to, to ensure that it stays it, sterile. And yeah, and doesn't it just 
once it hits the air, it yeah, if you leave, if you quickly. pour water into a bucket in your backyard within, I don't know the number, but a few hours, let's say the bleach essentially dis dissipates, but it's, it's very safe. And also note that none of our water is, is for drinking use. It's for irrigation, but, but in trace amounts, it's very safe. Got it. And um, FEMA asked, uh, so there is a, is there a plant in the landfill to produce the biogas? Uh, effectively, yeah, there's not so much a plant, but there, they have, um, they have, it's an old landfill, no longer in use. And so the trash was disposed there for, for many, many years. Um, but since then, the landfill has been capped with uh, basically a plastic sheeting so that the gases do not escape. And they have, they have wells that have been drilled into the landfill um, that basically allow a place because this gas is constantly being naturally being generated in landfills these wells that um, allow the gas to escape into and then from there in these wells they have essentially a, a pumping system that draws that creates a vacuum and draws that biogas from the uh, from the landfill and yeah I'm, I'm saying i see a question that just popped up I, i'm saying biogas but really biogas is just it's methane with it's less concentrated methane. What we buy at our homes from PG&E is, is almost pure. It's concentrated methane and the biogas is about half as concentrated. 